Welcome to the Alan Watts Podcast, Being in the Way. I'm your host, Mark Watts. And today we're going to hear a talk called The Psychology of Mystical Experience. This was part of a series of talks that he did at San Jose State College. And this particular one was recorded on March 5th, 1972. It's 32 minutes long. And after this, we're going to hear a talk on nothingness, that it was also a, one of the shorter recordings that he did during that period. Today's podcast was co-produced with the Ram Dass Be Here Now podcast network. Our theme music is by Zakir Hussein, courtesy of Moment Records, from his album Rhythm Experience. And now here's Alan Watts in The Psychology of Mystical Experience from San Jose State, March 5th, 1972. Well, then it has been announced that I will talk to you about the psychology of mystical experience. I have, through all my life, really been a disciple of William James, who, as you know, wrote a book called The Varieties of Religious Experience. I was always fascinated by his approach to this problem, because it involved a way in which we might understand the dynamics of various different accounts of people's visions of God, of their place in the universe. Sometimes these visions might sound very different. Some people seem to experience God as extremely far out and other, up there, as something to be venerated, adored and obeyed. And other people wanted to experience God as something completely inside, that is the essence of what you really when you come down to it, call yourself. And it seemed, therefore, that there was a conflict between these two forms of experience. But likewise, when you change this to another domain of experience, some people will describe a pain as a cold sting, and others will describe it as a hot pang because very, very cold is pain and very, very hot is pain. But it's really, when it comes down to it, it's the same kind of pain. And then, when you get into other weird extremes of human experience, ecstasy, think of absolute pleasure. So that there is a domain where pleasure and pain reach each other, so that we weep for joy, and shudder with delight. So therefore I am very, very suspicious about these accounts of religious experience. Whether the people who experience God as the extremely transcendent, like Isaiah, where he sees the Lord high and lifted up and the cherubim are veiling their faces with their wings, that experience, and the experience of the Upanishads, Tattvamasi, Yurit, whether they are not two different forms of the same thing, described in different kinds of language, just as we can ex describe ecstasy in the language of pleasure, and we can describe it in the language of pain. And by this sort of thinking, I seek to unify the quarrels between religions. because I will as willingly sit in meditation with Buddhists where they cross their legs and look exactly like the image of their venerated being, the Buddha, on the one hand. And on the other hand, Christians or Jews or Muslims who will bow before the unseen transcendent presence. 
I'll go with either one. But what it comes to, and what is, I think, of vital interest to every one of us, is that we are all aware of being alive at the end of time. In what the Hindus call Kali Yuga, things are running out. We are haunted by a, a, an insuperable set of problems. Overpopulation, pollution, the nuclear bomb, irreconcilable political conflicts. And every one of us has the sense, the haunting feeling, that these problems cannot be solved and that probably we have only about 30 more years of life on this planet. It may not be so. We may muddle through. But the fact of the matter remains that within 30 or 70 years from now, all of us will be dead. Anyway. And we know that, and it's a haunting idea in the back of our minds. And then what? See, I'm closer to it than I used to be. I'm now 57 years old. And a lot of people are dead at 57. And I look at this problem with complete fascination. <laughs> and you all have to face it. You're all going to evaporate and turn into bones and dust. And instead of avoiding that, instead of looking the other way, instead of saying, oh, well, later, let's look at it. What would it be like to go to sleep and never wake up? Every child thinks about this. Philosophers disdain the question. Because they say, oh, that's a meaningless speculation. You're just using words. But for a child, as is for an essential person, it's very real to think about. What would it be like to go to sleep and never wake up? <laughs> now, let's face facts. Let's not dream of reincarnation or of heaven or of Devachan or of worlds beyond. But supposing it's very real that when you're dead, you're dead. You're never going to wake up again. Well, I think I scratch my head and I say, well, that's not going to be like going into the dark forever. Because darkness is something I can imagine. It's not going to be like being buried alive. It's going to be like nothing. It's going to be like as if I never had existed at all and never anything else had existed at all. It's just going to be like it never was. And that makes me think on the one hand of, well, wasn't that the way it was before I was born? When I think backwards in time, I can remember it to a certain distance. And then I come to a blank, total blank. And yet, here we are. We all came out of it. The other thing it makes me think of is that if I want to realize total blankness as best as I can right now, I'm going to try and look at my head with my eyes. And no matter how I turn around, I can't see my head. And it isn't that there is a black spot behind my eyes. There is a total blank. Same kind of total blank, nothingness, as that out of which I came into this world. And then I look around me at night into the universe, and I look at the stars. And I see these vividly real, energetic points of fire scattered all over the sky in the middle of black nothingness. Now, how would the stars look if there were no space? 
How would space look if there were no stars? You see? The two go together. You cannot realize what you mean by is unless you have also along with it a thing that you understand is, isn't. Void goes with form. The Buddhist sutra says, shiki soku ze ku ku soku ze shiki, which means that which is form, that exactly is voidness, that which is voidness, that exactly is form. Now all mysticism is comprised in this. Mysticism, as we use it in an English word, comes from the Greek muin, mu. And that means the finger on the lips, quiet. Mum's the word. We can't really say it. There is a secret. There is something that you're not supposed to know but that you should know for your sanity, and we're going to pass it on to you on the QT. In ancient times, it really was on the QT, but nowadays, nothing is on the QT. Everything has been published. All knowledge is available. There's no possibility anymore of there being anything esoteric. You know, everybody has smoked marijuana and taken LSD and uh, practiced yoga, and... <laughs> <laughs> so all this is a matter of public discussion. And it is of the essence of scientific honesty to make all information public. And it's also the essence of democracy. If we are a republic where all men are equal, everybody, every single citizen of the United States, however well or not well educated, has a right to the access to all information. That's supposedly what we believe in. That is another way of saying, listen to this, that is simply another way of saying that you are all God. There isn't someone else who's God, who's the boss over you. Because that would be a mon monarchy and not a republic. And the trouble with the United States is that this republic is peopled by a lot of people who believe that the universe is a monarchy. And therefore, they take an attitude which is paternalistic, authoritarian, and are in conflict with the basic ideas upon which people like Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and so forth founded this republic. And that's the basic social conflict which we have to face. I could go into the history of this indefinitely, but let it stand at the moment. Let's go back to death. And we can see, a very, by a very simple process, that when you're dead, you go into the negative dimension of unconsciousness, like you do when you go to sleep every night. Now, sleep refreshes you. Isn't that curious? Sleep is a very little understood phenomenon by psychologists. But being unconscious for a while, being nowhere, brings you back to life. Of course it does. Because you wouldn't know you were alive unless you had once been dead or unless you occasionally went to sleep. You wouldn't have the feeling of reality, of hearness, of nowness, of uh, sensitivity like this when you pinch yourself, unless it could be contrasted with nowhere, with nothingness. All our knowledge, all energy is a phenomenon of contrasts. 
like a wave, supposing energy itself is basically a wave phenomenon. There is the crest and there's the trough, and it goes yo 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 yo, and it's upstanding, convex, and downstanding, concave. And this, of course, is the difference between the male and the female. And if we understand this, we're not going to have any more fights about women's lib. The male is upstanding. The female is hollow. See? And you cannot realize the one without the other. This is absolutely basic. You cannot see the figure without the ground. You cannot understand what is important. Imp. So rather mischievous. Without what is unimportant. <laughs> fades into the background. All logic, all discourse, all thought, all imagination, all consciousness depends upon this contrast. And the secret of it is, that this is the thing that I was talking about as mum's the word, mui, is that the two go together. that what appear to be things opposed, unrelated, fighting, are really things that can't do without each other. Jung, I, when I saw Jung in 1958, just before he died, we had a long talk in his summer house on the edge of Lake Zurich, and there were swans around there. And as we walked out at the end of the talk, I said to him, is it true that swans are monogamous? He said, yes. Yes, it is curious that they are monogamous. And do you know another interesting fact about swans is that when the male and the female begin to make love to each other, they start by fighting until they discover what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> he said, this has been of great help to some of my female homosexual patients. He didn't explain it further, he just dropped it and left it at that. <laughs> but make love not war, you see, is a very great statement, not of an ideal, but of a necessity. Something that we're going to have to do, whether we like it or not. Because the opposites, the things that we seem to see as in absolute conflict, consciousness and unconsciousness, life and death, black and white, are absolutely essential to each other. And we can take this, you can flip it suddenly into any dimension of human experience. Let's take black people and white people. This is a caricature because there aren't really black people and white people. There are brown people and grayish pink people. <coughs> but nevertheless, call it black and white. And we realize the richness of experience just because there is this differentiation. The way black people swing and behave wouldn't be realizable unless it were in contrast with the way white people behave. And the two groups have to learn to be grateful to each other for their difference. Like man and woman. It's the same thing. Vive la petite différence. <laughs> and so also, all in-groups, people who consider themselves elect and saved, right, and uh, like the church, must realize they could only understand that in terms of an outgroup who are the damned, the awful people who live the other side of the tracks, who are in hell. Even St. Thomas Aquinas gives away the secret that the saints in heaven occasionally walk to the edges of the battlements and look down 
at the squirming, burning sufferings of the damned in hell and give praise to God for the administration of divine justice. <laughs> he said that. <laughs> so that by contrast with the sufferings of the damned, they know in what bliss they are. So I'm sort of making jokes and giving parables to express the point that we know what is, what is reality, what it is to be alive and to exist, always by contrast with nothingness, space, emptiness and death. Just as we see the stars as points of brilliant, vibrant energy, only by contrast with the blackness of the night and the emptiness of space. And the one gives the other. Look at it in this way. What do you mean by the word clarity? Clarity. What do you think of when you say clear? Well, one thing you might think of is clear in the sense of wiped clean, transparency, empty space, finely polished mirror, a perfect flawless lens, clear. The next thing you think of with the word clear is completely articulate form. Something where the outlines are perfectly definite, totally in focus, did you see now, this is a fascinating thing, that in the one idea of clear, you have emptiness wiped clean and form in perfect expression. So this is the meaning, of course, of that Buddhist saying, shiki soku ze ku, ku soku ze shiki. Emptiness is form, form is emptiness. All embraced in the idea of clarity. So therefore, we go on. Another con fundamental contrast in experience, like form and space, is the voluntary and the involuntary. What you do on the one hand and what happens to you on the other. Now this is absolutely basic to most of us. We know, or we think we know, that there is a thing called what I'm doing, my influence on it, and on the other hand, its influence on me. Self and other. And our big conflict is to make self win over other. That's what we call the conquest of nature. Collectively, humanity as self wants to subdue, beat down, and control what is called other. Now, we don't really want that. Because if we succeeded in that enterprise, if we made the element of experience, the thing that happens to us, that is not in our control, if we put that completely under our control, we would be bored to death. It would be like screwing a plastic woman. Nobody wants that. When you love someone, you want them to come at you in an unexpected way. Not too unexpected, <laughs> but anyway, fairly unexpected. <laughs> you want to feel that there's something out there that uh, is different, see, that will surprise you. Well, so in exactly the same way, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't be able to experience the sensation that you call self being a source of action more or less in control, unless it had the contrasting field of something other that is not in control, that you never know what it's going to do. See, these two sensations go together, they're back in front of the same coin.
And so the whole technological enterprise of the West, which is designed to control the universe by technological methods, is in the end not sufficiently conscious of itself to know where it's going. And it is all moving towards, because you see, we don't understand. It is not part of our education that we understand this relationship between opposites. We are so frantic to survive and so terrified of the night of death that we are going to destroy the planet out of our anxiety to survive. The whole colossal military enterprise that is wasting the energies of the earth, the Americans, the Russians and the Chinese are wasting their substance in the most appalling way in creating so-called defensive technologies, instruments to protect themselves from each other, which can only destroy all of us. They can do nothing else. They protect no one. You know, like in the next war, join the Air Force and be safe. <laughs> You're the only people who will be. You'll be miles up in the air or away under the ground somewhere. Women and children can go hang. No one is going to protect them anymore. The whole technology of the military world is completely wasteful and destructive, but it's all being financed in the name of survival. In other words, you want to survive so badly that you're going to have to commit suicide. <laughs> So the point is, you don't need to survive. We don't really have to go on living. Because the nothingness of death, being the opposite of life, simply generates it. Like the space, the empty space of the sky is what is generating the stars. Like the womb generates the living being, the emptiness is the form. That's not in our logic. It was left out of our education. We never saw it. And therefore we have anxiety all the time. We think to be or not to be, that is the question. It isn't. <laughs> to be is not to be, and not to be is to be. They, they imply each other. They are the background to the figure, the figure to the background. And so stop worrying. And I'm saying this, not just to be a kind of a sophist and uh, play at you with funny ideas, but to suggest that it is very important at this time that human beings cool it. <laughs> that we reduce the volume of our anxiety and take things easy. That we eat less, run around less, fuss less about being there. I really seriously suggest this. Now look, a lot of people don't know they're alive unless they're making a tremendous vibration. A lot of people need to get behind the wheel of a car or a plane that goes Wham! and then they really know they're there. They're going, Wham! you know, and that's it. Oh my, I'm a man. <laughs> you know, and this is fouling the atmosphere and creating an immense noise is making a great impression, yes. But really, seriously, do you have to <laughs> expend all that energy to realize you're there? 
or they have to hit someone. They have to get in a fight. They have to know I can knock you down. And that tells me that I'm real. But is this necessary? And I would suggest instead that you can equally well know that you're real instead of going to uh, watch a spectacle of prize fighting, instead of making a colossal din, you can equally well realize reality and its energy by simply humming to yourself or humming with other people. You know, we can all have a mutual hum. <laughs> oh. And you can dig that. You can get with it. You get right into it. See? And you can feel that soft, deep energy. And you won't have to go roaring around, knocking people over the head and so on. So you just get with this, that that is the life thing going. That is God. That is the energy. And uh, you can hold hands and sit around in a circle and go, oh. And it sounds silly to Americans. They say, what will happen to progress if people do that? <laughs> well, as G.K. Chesterton said, progress is finding a good place to stop. Welcome to my home. We are aboard the ferry boat Vallejo, which is tied up at the north end of Sausalito, close to San Francisco. And this is where I live. And you may think this place is rather weird. But that's because I've always loved weird things. I remember when I was a little boy, people used to say to me, Alan, you're so weird. Why can't you be like other people? Well, I thought that was just plain dull like having the same thing for dinner every day. And as is well said, variety is the spice of life. So you will indeed find this place uh, rather strange. And some of the things that are weird are weird because they are just obvious and nobody ever thinks of them. Some of the most fascinating scientific discoveries have been made by people who called ordinary common sense in question, like anybody can see that the Earth is flat, and people know it's flat. And calling that fundamental assumption in question is really the beginning of geography. And when I think over the weirdest of all things I can think of, you know what it is? Nothing. The whole idea of nothing is something that has bugged people for centuries, especially in the West. Because we have a saying in Latin, ex nihilo nihil fit, which means that out of nothing comes nothing. You can't, in other words, get something out of nothing. And it's occurred to me that this is a fallacy of tremendous proportions that lies at the root of all our common sense, not only in the West, but in many parts of the East as well. And it comes up as a kind of terror of nothing, a put down on nothing, on everything to do with nothing, everything associated with nothing, such as sleep, passivity, rest, and even the feminine principle is often equated with the negative principle. Although women's lib people don't like that kind of thing, but when they get through understanding what I'm going to tell you, I don't think they'll object. Because what has struck me is that nothing, the negative, the empty, is exceedingly powerful. 
I would say, not ex nihilo nihil fit, out of nothing comes nothing, but I would say you can't have something without nothing. For how do we basically begin to think about the difference between something and nothing? I can say, there is a cigar in my right hand and there is no cigar in my left hand. And so we get the idea of is here and isn't or empty here. But behind that, of course, lies the far more obvious contrast of solid and space. Now, we tend to think of space as nothing. When we talk about the conquest of space, there's a little element notice of hostility in that phrase. But actually, we're talking about the conquest of distance. Space as such, that is to say, whatever it is that lies between the Earth and the Moon and the Earth and the Sun, is considered, especially since the Michelson-Morley experiment, which proved there was no ether, is considered to be just nothing at all. But to suggest how very powerful and important this nothing at all is, let me point out to you that if you didn't have space, you couldn't have anything solid. To begin with, without space outside the solid, you wouldn't know where the solid's edges were. For example, you can see me on the camera because you see a background here and all around me, and that background shows up my outline. But if that wasn't there, then you would notice, say, only the beads and the microphone here, and this would become the background. But you always have to have a background to see a figure. You just can't do without it. So that means that the figure and the ground the solid and the space in some way are inseparable and go together. Now, we find this very commonly in the phenomena of magnetism and electricity. A magnet has a north pole and a south pole, and a battery has a positive pole and a negative pole. There is no such thing as a magnet with one pole only. That's supposing we equate with north with south and north with is and south with isn't then we see we can't do without the two of them. You can chop the magnet in two, supposing it's a bar magnet, and you'll just get another north pole and south pole on the end of each piece. And so in the same way, a current will not flow through an electric circuit until the negative pole is connected as well as the positive. Because the current does not wait in the wire like water in a hose and then begin to flow when you, as it were, connect it with the negative pole, like turning on the nozzle, there won't be any current in the wire at all until its end point, which is the negative, is established. So what this is trying to get into our basic logic is this, that there isn't a sort of fight between something and nothing. You know the famous words of Hamlet, to be or not to be, that is the question. It isn't. To be or not to be is not the question. Because, as I think I've shown, you can't have a solid without space. And therefore, you can't have an is without an isn't, a something without a nothing, a figure without a background. And we can turn that right the other way around and say, you can't have space without solid. Because imagine nothing but space. Space, 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 with nothing in it at all forever. But there you are imagining it, and you're something in it. To have the whole idea of there being only space and nothing else at all is not only inconceivable, but perfectly meaningless. Because we always know what we mean by contrast. We know what we mean by white in comparison with black. We know life in comparison with death. We know pleasure in comparison with pain, up in comparison with down. But you will notice of all these things that they must come into being together. You don't have first something and then nothing, or first nothing and then something. Something and nothing are two sides of the same coin. 
And as you know, if you take a coin and you file away the tail side of it, and you file that side of it away completely, the head side will disappear as well. So in this sense, the positive and the negative, the something and the nothing, are inseparable, they go together, and in this way you could say that the nothing is the force whereby the something can be manifested. Without space, we couldn't see the stars. The stars not only occupy space, but have space between uh, one point of the sphere and the opposite point. So the space everywhere is absolutely basic to there being anything at all. Now, ordinarily, we think that what is basic to the physical world is something we call matter. And then matter has various shapes. We think of tables as made of wood. We think of pots as made of clay. But I ask you, is a tree made of wood in the same way as a table is? No, that would be stupid, isn't it? Because a tree is wood. It isn't made of wood. Wood and tree are two different names for the same thing. But there's in the back of our mind the notion, as a root of common sense, that everything in the world is made of something, made of some kind of basic stuff. And physicists, through the centuries, have, of course, wanted to know what that was. And physics began as a quest to discover the basic stuff out of which the world is made. And with all our advances in physics, we've never found it. What we have found is not stuff, but form. We have found shapes. We have found structures. Because when you turn up the microscope and you look at things where you thought there was some sort of stuff, you find instead form, pattern, structure. You find the shapes of crystals. And you go in beyond the shapes of crystals and you find molecules. And you go in beyond molecules and you find atoms. And you go in beyond atoms and you find electrons and positrons. Between which there are vast spaces. And we can't make up our minds as to these electrons. Whether they're waves or whether they're particles. And so we call them wavicles. But they're very tiny. And if you want to ask what stuff are electrons made of, we might be able to make a further analysis, but what we will come up with will never be stuff. It will always be a pattern, a moving pattern, which can be described and measured, but we never get to any stuff for the simple reason that there isn't any. You see, what stuff is, actually, is when you see something unclearly or out of focus, it becomes fuzzy. You know, we say stuffing in something like kapok in a cushion or stuff like clay because when we look at it with the naked eye, it looks just like goo. We can't make out any significant shape to it. But then when you put it under the microscope, you suddenly see shapes. It comes into clear focus as shape. And you can go on and on and on, looking into the nature of the world, and you will never find anything except form. Because think of stuff. Why, you wouldn't know how to talk about it, even if you found it. How would you describe what it was like? You couldn't say anything about a structure in it. You couldn't say anything about a pattern or a process in it, because it would be just absolute primordial goo. Well, what else is there besides form in the world? Obviously, between the shape, the significant shapes of any form, there is space. And space and form, in that sense, go together as the fundamental things we're dealing with in this universe. And that's why there's a Buddhist saying. Really, the whole of Buddhism is based on this saying, which is, that which is void is precisely form, and that which is form is precisely void.
let me illustrate this to you in an extremely simple way. When you use the word clarity, what do you mean by clarity? What's the first thing you think of when I say clarity? Well, it might be a perfectly polished lens or mirror or a clear day when there's no smog and the air is perfectly transparent, like space. Now, what's the next thing you think of? Clarity. The next thing you think of is form in clear focus. All the details articulate and perfect. So the one word clarity suggests to you these two apparently completely opposite things. The clarity of the lens or the mirror and the clarity of articulate form. And it is in this sense then, you see, that the Buddhists say form is void, void is form. Or we could put it in another way. Instead of saying is, we could say implies. Or the word that I invented goes with spelled all in one, like a front goes with a back, a male goes with a female, and so on. So form always goes with void. And there really isn't in this whole universe any stuff. Form, indeed, is inseparable from the idea of energy. And frisky form especially when it's moving in a very circumscribed area, appears to us as solid. In the same way, for example, when you spin an electric fan, the empty spaces between the blades sort of disappear into a blur, and you can't push a pencil, much less your finger, through the fan. So in the same way, you can't push your finger through the floor, because the floor's going too fast. But basically, what you have down there is nothing except nothing and form in motion. I know there was a physicist at the University of Chicago. He was rather crazy like some scientists. And <laughs> this impressed him so much, the ins insolidity, the instability of the physical world, that he used to go around in enormous padded slippers you know, for fear he should fall through the floor. But here it is, this common sense notion that the world is made of some kind of stuff is shown to be a, a nonsense idea in the back of our minds. It isn't there at all. But instead, form and emptiness. Now we all know that energy is always vibration, pulsation. Whether it be the energy of light or the energy of sound, it's always on and off. And in the case of light, say you get very fast light, very strong light, uh, even say with alternating current, you don't notice the discontinuity because your retina retains the impression of the on pulse. And so that carries over during the off pulse and you don't notice the off pulse except in a slow light like an arc lamp. And it's exactly the same thing with sound. When you hear a high note that goes, it seems much more continuous that's because the vibrations are faster than a low note, <clears throat> as when I go, oh. Now, in that, you can hear a kind of graininess. And that graininess is because you are hearing the rapid alternations of on and off on a lower note. So that all wave motion, then, is this process. And it's curious, isn't it? When we think of waves and talk about waves, we think about the crests. We think about this point. And we say, that is waves. And that is because the crests stand out from the underlying uniform bed of water, which is relatively solid in comparison with the space above, so that these 
Crests are perceived as the things, the forms, the waves. But isn't it obvious that you cannot have the ups without the downs? You could call, you see, you get this dividing line here between above and below. Now, isn't it obvious, first of all, you cannot have the emphasis called a crest, the concave, without the de-emphasis or convex called the trough. They necessarily go with one another so as to have anything standing out, there must be, as it were, something standing down or standing back. So in this way, we must realize that if you had this part alone, the up part, that would not excite your senses in any way because there would be no contrast. In other words, when sound comes upon your ear, the eardrum vibrates. When the on pulse of the sound comes, the eardrum is driven in a little. When the off succeeds, the eardrum comes out again. And so the eardrum wiggles. If you just pushed it in uniformly and left it there, you wouldn't hear anything. In the same way, if there is no sound and the eardrum is not being pushed at all, you have silence. But to have sound, you must have the alternation of sound, silence, sound, silence, sound, silence. And so you get that which you can hear on a very deep note. Now, the same thing is true of all life together. We shouldn't really contrast existence with non-existence because actually existence is the alternation of to be and not to be, of positive and negative, of on and off. So you could say existence is eternal if we are to consider existence as this alternation of now you see it, now you don't, now you see it, now you don't, now you see it, now you don't. It is that contrast that presents the sensation of there being anything at all. Now, in light and sound, these waves are extraordinarily rapid so that we don't hear the interval between them. But there are other circumstances in which the waves are extraordinarily slow, as in the alternation of day and night, light and darkness, and the much vaster alternations of life and death, of the great slow cycles of the world. But these alternations are just as necessary to the being of the universe as in the very fast motions where we get it in light and in sound and in the sense of solid contact, where it's going so rapidly that we notice the continuity or the is side and we ignore the intervention of the isn't side. But it's there just the same, just as there are vast spaces within the very heart of the atom. Now, another thing that goes along with all this is that it's perfectly obvious that the universe is a system which is aware of itself. In other words, we as living organisms are forms of the energy of the universe just as much as the stars and the galaxies. And through our sense organs, this system of energy becomes aware of itself. But there's a puzzle in this, which again relates back to our basic contrast between on and off and something and nothing, which is this. That the aspect of the universe, which is aware of itself, that is to say the aspect which, to put it in a very clumsy phrase, does the awaring, does not see itself. In other words, you can't look at your eyes with your eyes. You can't kiss your own lips. You can't bite your own teeth. You can't observe yourself in the act of observing. All scientists, neurologists, physicists have wanted to do that, but they can't do it. Just as you can't touch the tip of this finger with the tip of this finger.
no matter how hard you try. And that therefore creates on the backside of all observation a blank spot. Just for example, as behind your eyes, from the point of view of your eyes, however you look around, there is, is blankness behind them. That's the unknown. That's the part of the universe, in other words, which does not see itself because it is seeing. And so we always get this division of experience into one half known, one half unknown. We would like, of course, it would be fascinating if we could know the always unknown. But if we say, examine the brain and the structure of the nerves behind the eyes, we're always looking at somebody else's brain out there. We're never looking at our own brain at the same time as we're investigating somebody else's brain. So there always remains this blank side of experience. Now what I'm suggesting to you is this, that the blank side of experience has the same relationship to the conscious side as the off principle of vibration has to the on principle. Do you see that? There's a fundamental division. The Chinese call them the positive side, the yang, and the negative side, the yin. That corresponds to the idea of one in our uh, language and zero. All numbers can be made of one and zero. That's the called binary arithmetic, which is used for computers. And so it's all made up of off and on, and therefore equally of conscious and unconscious. But the unconscious is, so to say, the part of experience which is doing consciousness. Just as the trough manifests the wave, the space manifests the solid, the background manifests the figure. And so all that side of life which you call unconscious, unknown, impenetrable, is unconscious and is unknown and is impenetrable because it's really you. In other words, the deepest you is the nothing side, is the side which you don't know. So in this sense, don't be afraid of nothing. I could make a joke and say there's nothing in nothing to be afraid of. But people in our culture are terrified of nothing. They're terrified of death. They are uneasy about sleep because they think it's a waste of time. And they have a lurking fear in the back of their minds that all this universe is eventually going to run down and end in nothing. And it will all be forgotten, buried and dead. But this is a completely unreasonable fear because it is just precisely this nothing which is always the source of something. Think of it once again in the image of clarity. We say crystal clear. Nothing is what brings something into focus. And this nothingness symbolized by the crystal is your own eyeball, your own consciousness, and the clear space in which all the stars have freedom to be seen. Our podcast today was produced in conjunction with the Ramdas Foundation and the Be Here Now Podcast Network. And our theme music is by Zakir Hussein, courtesy of Moment Records from his Rhythm Experience album. If you'd like to find out more about Alan and his spoken works, please visit us at alanwatts.org. Thank you for listening. <laughs>